take every day and every opportunity like it's your last and soak it up. Business of Architecture UK, episode 50. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK and I'm your host Ryan Willard and this week's episode actually comes from Nashville, Tennessee in the US of A and it was an impromptu unplanned podcast but I had the good fortune to stay in a very beautiful hotel called the Dream Hotel in Nashville and I was sitting at the bar wearing uh, a newly it was a Christmas present that I had they were a green uh, they were a green pair of Nike Air Forces so there's a very distinctive texture to them and they were very nice uh, beautiful velvety green anyway a young man uh, decided to sit down next to me and tell me how beautiful my shoes were. And um, he also started doing a faux English accent. And I was slightly confused as to whether he was genuinely English or it was an American putting on a poor English accent. I was slightly slightly baffled by it. And we got chatting and this guy, Corey, um, was telling me about, you know, about what he does and I told him that I was doing a podcast about for architects and he says oh do you do you would you ever interview creative directors and I was like yeah of course and so he says well I'm the creative director of the dream hotel group so he basically was the creative director for the entire group of hotels one of which I was just staying in and the hotel was beautiful I mean you might have seen it if you follow me on Instagram if you don't go and follow me on Instagram um, but I was doing stories about it and, uh, you know, showing some of the beautiful detailing of it. And so Corey's role is basically he's responsible for the design, the branding, the art direction, as well as the creative programming um, partnerships and activation for this for the company and, and its portfolio of, of brands. And it was an amazing conversation because we sat down and we had... Um, we had a we had a drink and we, I quickly ran upstairs and got the podcasting equipment out and it was really inspiring because Corey's had a really incredible career and he's worked as a visual artist before um, then he's moved into uh, creative direct uh, creative direction and, and he's got all sorts of new projects which are on the horizons new creative endeavors and I really understood why he's been so hugely successful when he's collaborated with all sorts of you'll hear him in the interview. He, he says a lot of the people that he's collaborated with from architects from David Rockwell um, and many others. Uh, you can hear from just his personality and his sort of fearlessness to why he's been so successful and the fact that he was able to come and, you know, just start up a conversation with me. And um, But it was that kind of charisma that was really, really lovely and really, really you know, it was very disarming and it enabled a conversation to open up and for us to get talking and to create a podcast and just really in enjoy, basically. And and that was, you know, that's that kind of ability to be able to go and connect and start conversations with anybody, any place, any time. I really think that's one of the keys to any kind of successful person is being able to have that kind of fearlessness. And Corey talks a lot about that and how he, how he sort of, you know, he visualizes himself doing something very successful. And he goes into a lot of the, of the sort of the inner game, if you like, about success. Anyway, enjoy. This is a fantastic interview with Corey Brian Ingram. Hello and welcome to the business of architecture. And I'm still in Nashville at the moment, and I'm in this beautiful hotel called the Dream Nashville Hotel. And I was sitting at the bar, and uh, Corey here, who I'm sitting with, welcome Corey to the show. Thank you for having me. You noticed my trainers, and you came and started a conversation, and yeah. said that you were an interior designer, and you're actually the interior designer who is responsible for, well, the creative director um, of the interiors and the, the graphics as well. Yes, so let's back up a yeah. little bit. First of all, I love your shoes. Thank they're you. amazing. <laughs> um, they're like the perfect shade of green. Like if green could ever be green, this is the green it should be. <laughs> should never be another shade. And I, I am a creative director. I've, I've been a creative director for probably 
17 years. Right. Um, I came from beauty and fashion, and now I'm working in hospitality with Dream Hotel Group. So I am not the interior designer. We actually used Meyer Davis to design this spot, but I worked very closely with Meyer Davis, our operators and our developers, uh, including the Frist family and Alex Marks, to design this beautiful hotel in Nashville. It's amazing. It's absolutely... I've, I've been actually... Instagramming it and telling everybody how stunning the bathrooms are and the polished concrete floors and the light fittings and every aspect of it is pretty stunning. I agree. I mean, I think Meyer Davis and Gray and Will and the teams, Sonia and Kim and Sam, they've really listened to the emotion behind what we wanted to do here in Nashville and you know, Jennifer, who was heavily involved, um, and myself and Michael Lindenbaum, and we just really all sort of poured our passion and, and inspiration and aspiration to what we thought this needed to be. And there's so much rich, rich history here that um, we wanted to tell that story, but not replicate it. We wanted to make it fresh and modern and clean and slick and uh, but, you know, really warm and inviting and authentic. And mm. those are really challenging things to do. But together we we all had the same, you know, uh, vision. And, and we just kept with, um, kept with it. Uh, Meyer Davis is excellent at what they do. So it, they made it easy. You know, they really did. They're just always presenting such beautiful options. So let's, let's, let's talk a little about you and your, your business, your role, and how you got started in, in the world of design. Yeah, it's such an interesting story because, you know, I've, I've been doing design in all different ways and levels and since I was, like, a child. I mean, from the time that I was able to, like, be independent of my parents, I was merchandising our house and re-accessorizing our living room and, um, you know, changing the mantle and, you know, redecorating the Christmas tree. Like, and so I went to art school. Yeah. I have a degree in fine arts. Um, I studied installation art um, and I was very successful at that. I actually um, showed in a couple major museums. I uh, did the Raymond Nasher in Dallas and the Denver Contemporary and uh, the uh, D DMA. And um, I went to art school and I, you know, during art school, I wanted to do something that was creative and make a living. So I started doing store windows and I'd read this book called um, Confessions of a Window Dresser that Simon Doom, Doonan, Doomen, Doonan, excuse me, I know, sorry, Simon, I love you, and Jonathan, of course, too, and Liberace, <laughs> um, had written, and I read it, like, in one night. It's, it's an easy read, but all of, all of his books, by the way, are fantastic. Um, and so I had, like, I was like, okay, this is something I want to do, and one day I want to go to New York and be a window dresser, and, you know, that's it. And so that was my path, and... So I started to, you know, make a living in college, waiting tables in a gay bar. Actually, I was a bar uh, uh, shop boy. I wore a little scantily <laughs> like underwear and walked around and got tips doing little naughty things. And then I also did windows. And that's how I paid my way through college and university. And um, that sort of like gave me the idea of this three-dimensional space but then with that because you're in a retail environment and you're in a or you're in a like a mart or a wholesale envi environment selling whether it's beauty or fashion you have to have this sort of you know branding layering and you have to understand that you know like it's not just about like the props or how it looks but it's really about like the the branding and the the typography and all of the different things that layer in to make it interesting and so that's how like how it started and i moved to new york um actually i met someone while i was merchandising who was a dinnerware designer and who named mark blackwell who sold his dinnerware out all over um like Harvey Nichols, Barney's, and he was like, would you come and design for me? And so he moved me to New York, and I was his, I started designing for him, and we started making products and selling them, and 
Um, and then I went from there to another company called Lawrence, uh, uh, and they did um, a, it was a very wealthy company uh, woman alice lawrence and she and her husband owned half of downtown right. tribeca right. and wall street and the lawrence family is a very big development family and they for a passion project i mean she lived in a house that you know uh, uh was i think it was uh, like thirty thousand square feet and it had one bedroom Designed by, uh, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> Ellie Tahari bought it actually. Wow. And yeah, and then and that was in the Hamptons. Right. So okay. she she was very she was 80, 85 years old when I went to work for her, but she hired me and we built you know a showroom together and we designed OSE, which is operating supplies and equipment for uh, mostly hospitality, food and beverage, and restaurants. And so. All of a sudden, I found myself like at you know twenty four years old designing like O S and E with Danny Myers and Daniel Baluds and Steve and Elaine Wynn and Roger Thomas and they would come to the showrooms and I'd be fucking hungover having partied my face off the night before and you know I'd see Elaine Wynn or I'd see Daniel Balud and he'd be like I need a fouille de mer platter could you you know um, whip one up and I'd sketch it out and we'd make it in Mexico, India or China. And that's, yeah. So that was one, it goes on. I mean, there's a long legacy what, of design there, what, but what, what do you think has been one of your sort of keys to success or how would you define success? And already from an early age, you can see you're getting involved with some very high profile designers and collaborations what has been your sort of secret source if you like to get you into those types of situations i'm fearless i mean i i just have like you know like you you only have one life and i think that i don't know everything but i think i'm very much i have an entrepreneurial spirit and i'm very much about the idea of just figuring it out as i go along mm. like Nothing's well, I wouldn't say nothing seems too big. Like, definitely, like, um, you know, I couldn't perform like any type of surgeries or anything like that, or legalities or litigious situations. But, like, you know, like, you just sort of figure it out. Like, you know, if you're not, if you're fearless and you really are passionate, and I'm really inspired by culture. And, you know, when I say culture, I mean like all the things that re relate around it. And it's fashion, it's music, it's design, it's it's architecture, it's interiors, it's branding, it's, it's all of this, it's, it's olfactory, it's, you know, I, I mean, I, you know, I'm really inspired by things that are, you know, multisensorial, and um, so I don't really hold back, you know, I want to live the best life I can, exploring all the many different interests that I have, and so, you know, I'm again. I'm very, very, I'm very outgoing, so that works for me. <laughs> I think. I think that being outgoing, outgoing people who are not afraid to, you know, strike up a conversation and say, "Hey, you know, do you mind if I could teach at FIT?" And then all of a sudden, you're teaching at FIT. You know, like it's just like you have to be just like this podcast. I mean, I didn't even know you had a podcast, and I just thought you had cool sneakers, and all of a sudden. Five seconds later, we're in the back bar <laughs> at my, you know, at the hotel, like chatting. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think that for me is what's really exciting about meeting people like yourself. And when I meet very successful architects, designers, that there is this fearlessness. There is a kind of like, you know, you only get opportunities by the ones by stepping out of your comfort zone. And even the power of a conversation, of just striking up a conversation. We don't know who half the people are that we're about to engage with and so many projects can just happen as a result of totally I have a great talking. I have a great example of that and just to be clear though I'm an, I'm multidisciplinary yep. and but I am not a architect and I'm yep. not a, I'm a creative director and I'm you know really good at hiring those people and guiding them to get the project fully integrated and you know I always say the best projects are projects that are when the branding, the architecture, the interiors, and the digital all talk 
and service, obviously, right? But that's the best project. The best project, the best experience in the hospitality is when you have interiors, talking to branding, talking to digital, talking to architecture, talking to service and operators. And we're lucky here at Dream because I work with some badass operators like Michael Lindebaum, who is my right arm, Jeff Lee, Dimitri, those guys get me and I get them. And so we're like, like um, it's a bit of a motley crew, but we're good, you know, and we really do understand how to maneuver through, uh, you know, I, that, you know, je ne sais quoi. I don't know even know how to explain it, but we know how to maneuver through together what needs to happen. And you're, you're sitting in an example of our hard work. So. Yeah. What would you say is that je ne sais quoi? What is the when you're when you're hiring people, when you're building a team, what is it that you're looking for? What are the qualities that those team members? What is it the qualities of the of great architects bring to a project to make it work? Totally, totally. Well, we work with some of the world's best architectural firms, like David Rockwell, who is the sweetest guy I've ever met. I've personally worked with David on projects with Dream, but also projects on my own. And um, David is just a gem, um, and so is so are his different teams. Um, we worked with them for quite a lot of our projects. Would you about um, to introduce me? Huh? Would you about to introduce me? Would I introduce yeah. you, David? <laughs> uh, I sure. I mean, if he's not, you know, I mean, he's he's quite. <laughs> Sorry, a, I'll put you on the uh, spot there. No, 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 no. <laughs> I mean, I'm happy to introduce you. I mean, when you come to New York, obviously, I'll I'll make that connection for you. I mean, he's so unassuming and so personal and so he's just sweet mm. i mean he became very um i became um very um inspired by david's personality when we worked with him to do the entrance to vandal which was our partners tau group it was their big uh, kind of version of Beauty in Essex. And my best friend and client, Sandra De Ovando, had a, a, has a very successful uh, event and flower shop with brick and mortar in New York City. And her shops have been featured in Vogue and they're beautiful. And I've been working with her since she started her, her incubation and ideation on designing her stores and her branding. And her, I did her candle line. And so naturally when they, Tao asked Sandra Ovando to do the entrance into Vandal, she worked with me and David, Ro she actually hired me to do the project. And she was like, I want you to do it soup to nuts. And she was like, I don't have a big budget. And then she told me the number and I was like, I can do that. And then she told David the number and David said he could do that. So she hired David. <laughs> and I was like, wait a minute, David's price is the same as mine. And it was a really moderate price. I'll be honest. It was like, it was a totally like friends and family style, you know, but, um, David was passionate about the brand, her brand, and was really passionate about the project. And so he did it and he worked on it personally. I mean, David himself. And um, so I got the opportunity to work with him. She, you know, hired me too because I had, you know, done so many stores in brick and mortar with her. So it was really, really fun. Um, but yeah, we work with some great, like Will and um, Gray are phenomenal at Meyer Davis and, you know, they're, they're just remarkable people and they're, you know, um, uh, you know, just really down to earth and you don't think that they're going to be involved in the project, but they are mm -hmm. and they get heavily handed and they do show up and they uh, are involved in meetings and they're, they come and they visit and they're just really cool partners. And so in answer to your question, like, I think hiring uh, the right people is obviously about their portfolio. You know, that's one piece of it. But in, when you get into a project this size, which is, you know, a, uh, you know, we have a, uh, let's see, six restaurants, uh, six outlets, basically. We have Parlor Bar, um, the bar we're in now. We have our stateside restaurant, which I'll give you a tour of after this. We have... I took, I took, oh, you I, took a peek? I, no, okay. I took a peek. I, well, I want you to give me a tour, definitely. I'll give you a tour. Yeah. I'll give you a tour. I'll give you a tour. We have a, a sandwich shop that's opening on Printer's Alley. We have a, a retail store. We have a dive bar. We have a coffee shop and a cafe. And we have a, um, a music venue. And, um, so it's a lot of, it's a lot, you know, and, uh, so we're getting, 
you, you get into a project like this and you're you're in bed with these people for a long time. Like mm. you're in a partnership, you're in a relationship with them. So it takes a lot to, you want a partner that understands your needs as well. And, you know, I have my, you know, personally some ideation, uh, some ideas and our operators as well. Everyone's got a lot of ideas to bring to the table. So we want to be heard and seen. And so a good partner is someone that listens to you and understands, um, you know, how to navigate what your needs are and that's operational and budget and I think that's what you know they listen that the fact that marble you know we know it's going to stain and they listen to that they listen to like even though this is like a gorgeous <laughs> slab of marble and I'm like thinking to myself this is going to look really you know in a, bit, a hot minute this is going to look not like it looks now but um, actually I think this is a different substrate that they chose I remember this being something different it's not marble it's slick it's gorgeous. It's it looks slick. like marble, right? It's slick. I can't remember the name of this product. They showed it's it to Corian us. It's not Corian or something, is it? No, it's not Corian. It's um, I'll have to get. I'll get back to you on that one. But um, but that's what makes a good partner is someone that's really listening to you and you know listening to the clients. And we have a lot of cooks in the kitchen too. You know, you have the developers, you have the operators, you have the creatives, you have you know the clients. It's it's and and also the market, you know, and the brand. Mm. The brand has a voice too, you know, even though there's not a person there, I guess that's me, right? Re representing the brand. But, you know, I think um, that's, it's really important to have the uh, the right people listening and, and being able to make uh, modifications um, and to tweak what you're doing. So you, you, you mentioned there about fees and how your fees and David fees were the same. How do you set your fees? How do you negotiate fees? And when does it go right and when does it go wrong? It's interesting. Well, I mean, I owned my own branding agency um, and I designed my own hotel before I joined this group. And I was in the beauty and fashion business before that. And I got sick of all of the like young kids that just got out of RISD taking the jobs. And like literally, like they were charging, you know, 75% less of what I was asking, but I, it's like Picasso, right? Picasso charges like, you know, whatever he was charging at the time for a sketch of a little quick sketch that takes. Someone once said to him, like, how does, how is it that you're charging so much for something that takes you so little time? And it's that it took him 30 years to be able to get there. Right. And so for me, that's kind of my philosophy at that point when I was in, you know, doing developing brands, I was charging much more than a lot of people were coming in underneath me. And, you know, of course, every client, and I understand this because I had a brand before I opened my branding agency. So I understand going out and get multiple quotes and sort of evaluating the costs, right? So I had a struggle keeping up with like these young kids charging less, so they were less experienced. And the client doesn't know the difference, really. Yeah. And until you make a really big name for yourself, it's sort of like where you can charge whatever you want and people are like, oh, that's just go with him, you know, or her for that fact. Um, it's, uh, it's, you've got to be careful. But um, I mean, I sort of, you know, now I'm in, I'm in house. I'm in house. I actually, um, I developed our in house creative studio for Dream Hotel Group, which is called Reverie Studio. And I developed that coming on board, having developed my own studio and had, having done projects as a, as a consultant and, but how do you develop them? Well, you know, it values, it differentiates actually. And it, it, um, it's, it's really based on, uh, you know, you in a lot of ways, like as the owner and as the proprietor and the principal of your company, like what's important to you. Mm -hmm. And obviously you have to like break down the cost and, you know, you kind of know after time, like, what your services are and kind of roughly how much time goes into making a, a logo or how much goes into making a style guide or how much time goes into creating a lookbook or whatever that is. You get, you know, a good grasp of those. Um, but sometimes you undersell because you want the work. Yeah. Not because you need the work, because you really want that project. Mm. You know, there's something there that's resonating well with you and you want to... Um, you want to you want to be a part of it, 
You want to be a part of the story. You want to be, you want to impact it. I mean, we're not carrying cancer. That's for sure. There's no one here in our designers as designers. We're not, you know, I mean, sure, a lot of designers give back and they do philanthropic things, but ultimately we're not saving lives. We're making things beautiful and there is something to be said about that, yeah. but we're not curing cancer, you know, or doing anything like monumental to like revolutionize health or wellness or, well, I guess in design sometimes, but you get what I'm saying, right? So like, I think, you know. So how, how, do, how do you communicate that value? I answer been, that question? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think you can go a bit deeper by how do you communicate what the value is that you bring to a project to the client? I mean, personally, in the role that I'm in now, I think that the client really likes, because we do, we, we used to own all of our hotels, right? And we still do. We still own a lot of our hotels fully. We own the building, we own the hotel, we own all of it. And we realized it's much better for us to just operate them and sign HMAs and, you know, be the brand that, you know, the billionaires and the wealthy investors and the real estate guys stick, go to to run it and operate it. And we realized that and it took us a long time to do that. It took us 25 years to do that almost to decide a little less or whatever that that's our model. And so I think for me, um, I work with the development team. So I'm as um, you know, the creative director for Dream Hotel Group, I work very closely with our chief development officer and our CEO and our nine international and global development members who are placed all over the world. I work with them very closely to help get the project to the finish line. And you know, I think for me, I understand it. I understand the construction. I understand, you know, the 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 growth. I'm I'm able to ideate cut off the cusp. I'm um I also do these beautiful sort of, you know, concept magazines. So when we meet someone, I develop a beautiful magazine that looks like it's the real project after it's open and it has a magazine. So I write about it from an editorial perspective and you know, I showcase programming and I showcase like the uniforms and the scent and all of it, it all comes to life, even though it's make-believe at that point, right? Yeah. But it feels real. And I'm unassuming, too. I'm not a CEO. I'm not a guy in a suit. I'm in a vintage, you know, um, right now, a vintage bootleg 80s uh, Gucci sweatshirt that I overpaid for on the Lower East Side, for sure. But, you know, like, I'm unassuming, so, like, I don't think that I... You know, I'm myself, and I think that I add value there because I'm, you know, the the you know, and I I meet with billionaires and hang out with them. I was just with um, our team, we're working on a project in Belgium, and I was just with the Prince of Belgium, and we were traveling with him all over, and went to Paris, and you know, like I, it's just I don't have like a agenda. I just want things to be beautiful and organic and real and passion I think I bring that vibe and that authentic energy and I think that people see that mm. and they like that and it's refreshing because I'm not the one that's sending them a 70 page document contract that says <laughs> sign here you know I'm not I'm not I mean you know so I think that they feel that they can trust me and you know not not that they can't trust our group or trust our partners but I'm a different perspective a different facet to the diamond a mm. different light and mm. I think that they see that and it works and what have been some of your biggest obstacles that you've overcome in your in your career and in your business doubt really yeah I mean you know you get into something and you like I said it's kind of like the double-edged sword you know you say you want to go for it and then once you've got it fuck oops uh how do I do it? You know, how am I going to get there? How am I going to figure it out? And you start to think, am I really going to pull this off? And you can, you can trick yourself out quick. You can, you can psych yourself out. You can pretend, you know, that you're, or you can not pretend, but you can, you can make yourself believe that you're not going to be able to do it, you know? Um, so as, as confident as you can be, you can also get into, some dark moments because things get heated and, and you have to troubleshoot and, you know, it can come, it can become challenging. And then yeah. how have you, how do you personally resolve those types of types of moments? Um, I try to be honest with my clients and my, like when I don't really know if I can pull something off, 
um, when I'm in it. If it's too big and it's too much, then I try to like you know, come forward and say that we need outside help or we need the R&D or, you know, we really need to uh, think this out differently or this is not in my my realm or there's some issues I can foresee and I just try to be very transparent about it uh, because I think that that uh, it will save you. And most of the time it's like people are happy to hear that. You know, mm. they, they want to problem solve. And so, but have some solutions, have some ideas and some solutions that can get them through it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. What, how, when you're kind of planning out the route of like the next types of projects that you want to be working on, do you, do you do that or do things happen more serendipitously for you in terms of new clients, new work? Or do you say like, actually that, that's somebody that I want to be working with in the future? And you I manifest. I do a lot of manifestation. I really do. I'm, I'm, I'm very much about sitting in my own journey and, and not like in a selfish way. Like I really, it's more so like I never thought that I could be an artist. I was like, wow, you know, I'm, I'm never going to be an artist. And all of a sudden I was showing my work in museums. I never thought that I could design hotels and now I'm on my fifth. You know, like I, I never thought that I could be in the beauty or fashion business. And I had a global beauty brand that sold all over the world in 29 countries with shop and shops at Bergdorf's. And, you know, I never thought I could do those things. And then all of a sudden I wanted them and I, I did. I got them. I, I made it happen. Is it, and is there, so I really manifested it like I start you start telling yourselves yourself that you're going to do these things like you know you say I'm going to one day do these things and I think it's like that's what you have to say you have to say I am not I can't and you have to teach yourself the words are empowering and words do really resonate and they they linger and they stay close to us and you know the universe hears all of us and it's like just when you think of someone they show up it's just like that it's just very similar and so just try to know that you can accomplish whatever your dreams are they're there for you you just have to believe that you can and you have to say that you can and yes there are some qualifications that you have to put with them and i am qualified trust me but it's more so like um you know you have to just say you are sort of before you are there is a line I don't know exactly what it was but it's something along the lines like fake it till you make it you know yeah I'm sure you've heard of that yeah. right and it's sort of true in a lot of ways like um you do have to kind of like you have to yes this is who I'm gonna be this is where I'm gonna go I know I can do this mm. and you do it it's, it's really amazing that you, you say that because so many successful people that I've spoken with have talked about the mental game of success yeah. and the kind of uh, affirmations that they might tell themselves about, you know, actually they're seeing their success before it's, before it's happened. Is that something that you learned to do or is something you've naturally always done? Well, so backing up, no, I didn't, I didn't always do it. Um, I, I guess, you know, I guess I could say I always did it. I mean, when I was in college, I wanted to be an art star. I told myself I was an art star and I became sort of an art star, <laughs> you know? I mean, I didn't, I wasn't like, you know, a Damien Hirst or, you know, but I mean, I had my work. It was, you know, the only reason I stopped making art is that I couldn't, um, you know, it was lucrative. My art, I needed like, you know, my work cost a lot of money to produce. And so I needed people to buy it. And my, my work was very hard to buy. It was hard for a curator. I would say somebody like Frito-Lay or, a, you know, a big corporation that collected art could possibly buy what I did. But a collector like the Frists, they couldn't. It, there's no place to put it. It's not something that can hang in one of their homes, you know. Um, so uh, I stopped making it because I knew what I wanted to do was more experiences. And in a lot of ways, this is a transition of my art because my art was about you know, service, it was about uh, experience, it was about display, it was about environment, it was about multisensorial. 
Um, it had all of those things and all of those pieces in it. So, you know, um, but when I got out of the, when I was in, you know, out of, I left beauty, I, you know, left the brand that I started with the founders and I started my branding agency. And once I was two years in my, three years in my branding, branding agency, I said I wanted to design a hotel. And I went to Paris, and I was in the pa and I kept telling people I was going to design a hotel. One day I said, I, you know, I'm, I'm, what are you going to do? And I was like, I'm going to design a hotel. And everyone was like, well, that makes sense because I've been to your house, and I know how you entertain, and I love the way your house looks, and your everything is no, you know, you're the devil is the devil is in the detail is definitely your mantra, you know. And so I was in Paris. I was on a buying trip with 30 buyers that I was doing the style guides for. And I was at Maison Objet, which is the big show in Paris uh, for designers. And I was kind of sad. I was like, you know, my trip had like basically, you know, come to an end and I was tired of speaking my broken French and <laughs> practicing my terrible French. And so I uh, I went to the Palace Royale, and at that time, the Cartier had had an exhibition retrospective of all the history of Cartier. And I thought, oh, well, I have to see that for sure, so it was on my agenda. So I went there, and there was a lovely restaurant. It was raining that day. And I remember what I was wearing, actually. I was wearing a neoprene Kinzo crop top um, uh, a sweatshirt yeah. and some harem pants and like a white Margiela beanie and some aviators that were like glasses that were by Celine. I looked really crazy. I didn't have my stomach showing, thank gosh. But <laughs> I had, because the, that's not a good thing, but... For me, at least. But uh, I had like a little white T-shirt, but I was standing in line speaking French to this woman at this restaurant because it was raining outside and the line to get in the exhibition was very long. And I'm standing in there and I'm speaking French to the host and she's telling me, am I with the two women behind me? And I'm like, I'm not with those two women. I'm by myself, but she still thinks I'm with them. And I'm like, I am not with them. <laughs> New Yorker and me. And then I say that in English and the two women, one of the women, one of the women says to me, um, no, sit with us. And I go, uh-uh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm in New York. I'm not sitting with you. I mean, I'll say hi, but I'm not going to sit with you. And she was very aggressive and very sweet. And she said, no, 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 sit with us. Well, they were very modestly dressed and looked like they were from the Midwest. And I sat with them, and they were sweet and lovely. And anyway, ends up that their her husband owns um, quite a lot of real estate mm -hmm. and had a beautiful uh, building, four buildings, in the in one of the greatest cities in America, in Charleston. And um, we just started talking, and um, she introduced me to her husband and her son, and I ended up designing and concepting their first hotel, which Amazing. became one of America's top ten hotels according to Condé Nast Reader's Choice and number one in Charleston, so. Amazing. Yeah. What, what I'm getting from a lot of the, what you're saying in this, in this conversation is you've got, a, and obviously how we've just met as well, that your emotional intelligence or your people skills really are what's leading you in a lot of, a lot of this and actually allowing you to get into circumstances that just wouldn't normally manifest. Do you, do you think that's something that can be taught or is it something that, naturally is part of a personality and like what what would you say to architects or designers yeah i think that it can be taught i think that like at a young age i think you know we are getting into a place i know this sounds crazy like i'm going to just throw this out there to the world and yep. like just say this like i'm not an expert by but i think that like we're seeing like gender fluidity we're seeing acceptance more we're seeing people start to accept all types of people like you don't have to be pretty anymore to be accepted. You don't have to be gay or straight, excuse me. You can be anything you want to be, you know, and people will start to just like, I think people are much cool. Like the world is just getting better, you know, and, and, and in a lot of ways, in a lot of ways it's not, I mean, 
the people are getting better, right? We're we're sticking together. We're we're sort of pushing the assholes and the shitheads <laughs> out way, and we're like, it's no longer cool to be a fucking asshole, right? And so I think that like people are realizing that like kindness and generosity and genuine and all those things are really cool. And I think younger kids, that's gonna like come all the way down. I'm just I'm seeing that with like. I work with a lot of millennials and really young kids and I can see that in them. I can see their openness and their just confidence and in a lot of ways too confident. Sometimes they overstep boundaries mm. that I would never <laughs> like, I'm like, Oh, whoa, okay. You what, know, what, like what, what kind of boundaries? Um, I mean, I just think that they're, there's this sense of entitlement sometimes that I'm like, wait a minute, you didn't put in the 20 years that you need to put in, you know, before you can have that kind of entitlement, entitlement, <laughs> you know, like you need to do the work first, you know, but, um, but I just think that like, I do hope, and I think people are getting, even in the South, I have a, so many projects all over, but I come down to where I remember being in the South as a gay male and having some issues. And I just don't have those issues. Like, and I'm, not that they're not there. Mm. I'm not saying we're free yet, but it just seems like a better place. And I think, you know, I do think emotional intelligence is important for all things, whether it's professional or friendship, love, family, like being emotionally intelligent is, and I have a lot of emotions. I'm not like the non-emotional guy. It's more so just how you deal with them and, you know, being able to say I'm sorry or being able to say I'm afraid or being able to just talk about how you feel and, or just talk, mm. <laughs> You know, and not worry about um, what people think. How, how do you balance your professional life then with your personal life? That's a tough question has because that, has, it, has it ever kind of gone out of out of whack? I mean, I always find it interesting with people who have accomplished a lot or engaged with so many different projects and operating at that kind of very high level of performance. Like, how do you how do you have the time? What sorts of disciplines and routines do you use to kind of keep that in in order the only thing that i feel like out of balance with sometimes is diet and um and like you know i i work a lot um i don't really like shut off because like you know my work isn't like what i do like you know tonight for instance we're sitting in this bar like i went out and bought all this stuff that like these beautiful candlesticks and you know, the, that floral arrangement there and those vessels and you know, all these things I went out all day and bought so that I could prepare for our photo shoot tomorrow. And so, but like what I wasn't angry all day about being on Sunday and you know, I don't, our company's great. We, we really don't work on weekends at, you know, at corporate. We, you know, of course you have, you know, people who are, working and getting their things done but it's not a your typical environment where everyone's overworked everyone has a work life balance at our company our ceo and our our founder and our cfo really value life and family and so that's trickles down to our svps and you know everybody that's in the company so and vps everybody that's like working for the goal we feel that you know, culture. Um, but I wasn't angry. I, you know, I love what I do. I, I'm blessed. I'm very, very blessed to be able to be here and to be able to have the job that I have and, you know, to have the people around me. And I think that inspires me, um, all the time. So I, but balancing work and life, it's, it's challenging. I don't ever feel like I'm shutting off because, you know, having and developing food and beverage concepts and developing hotels, when I go out to eat on my, on my own time, I'm working, I'm looking at everything I'm watching. I'm watching the servers. I'm looking at the uniform. I'm looking at the detail in their shoes and their aprons. I'm looking at the stitching. I'm that myopic and I'm looking at the napkin. I'm looking at the business even when I'm not eating, I'm out shopping. I'm out merch. I, when I go shop, this is a, if you've ever shopped with me, I, you'll know this. You'll see this. Like I buy stuff, and as I'm buying, I'm re merchandising their stores. I, it's hilarious. I'm like, oh, the hangers are, are like not at the same, you know, like I need to like move the hangers. 
they're like I they're not at the same level. Like I need to like buy this coat and then move all those hangers. And it's like really crazy. So I'm always just kind of on that yeah. way and having conversations. But like when I do shut off, that's when I focus on wellness. And that's when I'm like going into nature and I'm taking walks and and I get inspired there too, but it's a different type of it's more like Uh (laughs) it's like oh that's like next level shit right because that's stuff that we can't make and that's stuff that no one knows how to make i mean Mm -hmm. well i wouldn't say that because there's some really cool people botanists and people who know how to like whatever whip ship like cross pollinate bees and make whatever royal butt bee jelly or whatever they call that royal jam jan royal jelly whatever anyway but The point is, is that when I'm in nature, I'm like, wow, this is when I can, I meditate uh, a lot every day. I meditate um, probably for 15 minutes in the morning um, and I do about 10 minutes in the afternoon. And on the weekends, I do a lot of self-help wellness situations. Like I love to improve myself. So Mm -hmm. I do like... You know, um, I go to uh, wellness centers, I do yoga, I do, you know, that's when I sort of shut down. Um, But eating and drinking and traveling uh, and shopping and like even museums, like hard to like turn it off. But I have recently picked back up sketching because I, you know, having an art degree, missed like just sketching. So I've, I've been carrying a sketchbook with me when I travel and sort of, being on vacation and sketching or reading that sort of turns it off for me and what to kind of wrap up what would you say to yourself if you were to meet the the younger you just entering into art college what what would you say to that person be present soak it up and be present because there were so many times that i just took advantage of my opportunities Selfishly, I just was entitled and felt like I didn't need to go or do. Take every day and every opportunity like it's your last and soak it up and really know that you're lucky to be there because there's so many people that don't get those opportunities to even show up. And the fact that you got accepted to university and the fact that someone can pay for it or you can get the financial aid or you got a scholarship like that just gives you so much more opportunity than so many people and the fact that you can drink clean water and the fact that you have clothes to put on your body just soak it up soak it up and be blessed and be humble and you know try to chip like chip out the noise to what other people think and how they think of you and try not to worry about fitting in too much because fitting in too much and worrying about fitting in too much is way too exhausted exhausting just do the opposite do what feels right to you and just be you amazing thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me and yeah do this impromptu podcast it's a real oh my god i'm gonna i'm gonna steal your stickers don't forget (laughs) we're gonna take i'm gonna like take this off your feet they're not gonna fit you well i'm still gonna have them on my cabinet i'm just gonna look at them i'm gonna set them in one of my little display cabinets to look at them no but thank you very much my pleasure absolute pleasure cheers cheers So that is a wrap. Thank you for listening. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.